Hello everybody, welcome to the Bentonville Film Festival. My name is Justine Ryan, and I am honored to bring you this amazing documentary called Power Lands. Uh, welcome to the question and answer discussion portion um, of this film. And we are here with the producer, Jordan Flaherty, and the director, Ivy Camille. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and again, welcome here to the ninth annual Bentonville Film Festival. And before we uh, get into anything, um, on behalf of the Bentonville Film Festival, I would like to take the time to acknowledge the indigenous people um, that were forced to leave their ancestral lands, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw nations with ties to the Northwest Arkansas area. We further recognize that a portion of the Trail of Tears runs through this area and that the, Cher the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations passed through what we now know as Arkansas during their first removal. We acknowledge all indigenous storytellers and in, in residents in our community and region, and we thank you. Um, and now I bring this amazing film that touches so much on um, indigenous lands and sacred lands, uh, power lands. And thank you again for coming, um, for creating this film. Absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, well, first, uh, the first question is what uh, drove you to tell this story um, about uh our connection with the land and the connection to power um, and, you know, electricity, coal and oil and all these things. Um, what drove you to tell this story in such a powerful way and an international way as well? Um, so I think for me, uh, growing up on Black Mesa, um, you know, like I'm still out here just ate some mutton last night straight off the res um you know we still fully live off the lands in a lot of ways right now where I'm at like not so much I live in Flagstaff but you know there's no running water there's no electricity we just got like a solar panel so now people can like charge their phones at the house at where I grew up but so we don't have any of that and being able to travel and meeting Jordan and doing these other things through film, I've seen how many other communities are also affected by this exact same story. You hear it over and over and over again. We don't have running water, we don't have electricity, but these surrounding towns, these surrounding countries do. Um, and it's forcibly being taken by these indigenous, um, uh, from these indigenous communities. But truthfully, there's so much vibrancy and there's so much um, to learn and grow from each community. Like just looking around here, outside on the plants that a lot of people would call weeds. I know different ways to treat. Uh, if you have an open wound, I can help you for a non-addictive like coffee substitute. I can help you figure out other things to use for sugar. I can tell you like how to make your own water bottle out of a plant outside. Um, and I know that it's not just my community. It's every single community out there, especially the indigenous ones. We have our roots in those places. Um, and so I think a lot of it for me is about telling the other communities because we've been isolated and separated. And that's part of what's happened with colonization and mm. those of genocide is they're keeping us separated and they're keeping us apart but by joining and building these communities we're sharing and telling each other stories it's also bringing back these really old ancestral practices that could be really useful for everything else going on jordan for you what um what drove you to uh be a producer in powerlands well, I was actually working on some stories for Al Jazeera and with Telesaur, and I met Ivy Camille on another story and we started collaborating together. And the film just sort of grew and developed. And I mean, I just knew from the first time I met her that, uh, that she was a brilliant talent. When we met, she was 19 years old um, and had already been an award-winning filmmaker for seven years, you know, won an award for her, her film when she made when she was 12. Um, and, you know, I think when we started this, we did not know where this would go. You know, we uh, kept sort of following the trail of these, of these chemical companies and of these communities and talking to different communities, seeing who wanted us to come and, 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 and where to travel. And, you know, we also shaped it a lot in editing. We had an amazing editor, Tim Tsai, and, and composer, Daniel French, who worked with um, people from a lot of the nations that we worked with. And, and, you know, I think the project just grew and, and developed and, and especially, you know, we're just so indebted to the people that we talk to in these communities. And, and I think that the debt that we owe them for their stories that they shared, they shared with us. I loved it. I, I love the, I think so many um, 
we don't understand our connection to the land and how it's so important. Um, the idea that, like you were saying, like a non-addictive coffee, like those things are, are, are important. And I think uh, a lot of times um, uh, we don't, we get scared to connect to the land because it, it means something. And a lot of times that thought that it means um, is connected to colonization. It's not connected to anything of our culture, doesn't mean anything bad, but it's been made bad. And so I loved um, how it opened up with uh, these, uh, I would say young adults, they looked young to me, uh, are coming, are, are, you know, on their ancestral land and they're like, we, we have to do right by our land and by our people. And I loved that because I think a lot of um, you know, young generations, I think millennials and, and Generation Z, they're starting to, they're fighting against these big um, companies because they're not doing right by them as we, our parents and grandparents may have been taught. And so seeing not just the fight, but also the, the things I have to learn. And I loved that consistent story because that was something that was consistent regardless if they were in the Philippines or if they're um, in Mexico, the story of we're going to continue to teach um, our people the way of the land um, as we fight. I think sometimes people think it's one or the other, but you saw it coexisting, which I thought was very powerful um, because so many times we we have to choose between fighting or our culture. Um, and I, I, I guess leads into me um, another question is, um, when going to these other um, areas uh, and learning their story, was there anything um, that you thought, well, maybe this is something I should bring back, um, bring back home and I should implement here? Or was there anything that you were able to impart on them and they were to able to implement in their own land? Uh, I would say every single location there was definitely something that you learned walking away from it's impossible not to like you have these incredible powerful smart individuals in front of you who are willing to talk to you about something that like in a million years you can barely fathom you're especially for me i'm looking at these plants and i'm like oh my god we have so many big plants there's so many different animals there's so many different things that i like can't even imagine processing with but and yet you're still when you cook it's the exact same vibe as when there's like a cooking out at Manelli's house there's um all these little kids running around and you have people teaching them because that teaching and that sharing of knowledge is resistance because that is decolonization that's what re-indigenizing means um is learning uh so much of our history and culture and everything that was taken was taken by way of reducing us to not being able to tell stories mm. because so much of who we are is that storytelling and you see it across so many different boards, especially without like written languages or other things. We do it all orally, we tell people. Um, and so yeah, every single place, there was a place that I wanted to take something back, of course. And there's so much that you can't. Um, but I think, again, the biggest message of the film is just like, you're not alone. And I hope that every single location that we went to, that's the best thing that they got. And I know that putting them in touch with other locations was great, putting, you know, the, the resistance in the fight is still going and it's never gonna stop with or without my interference. Mm. And I think that's the most powerful thing about it. I love that. I love that. Um, my next question is, uh, what was the most challenging um, aspect of doing this film? Um, because there was there was a lot of footage, uh, the interviews, also the different languages, because even within Mexico, everyone didn't speak, um, you know, Spanish. They're, they're speaking their indigenous languages. So... Was that um, the hardest thing? Was that like, oh, we could just, you know, we can always find a translator. Um, what was the most challenging thing um, when gathering these stories and meeting people um, when it comes to being a, a director and a producer? Uh, I think for me, the most challenging thing is just hoping that we did everybody justice. You know, like I care so much about every single person in that film. They're all incredible. They're doing amazing work. And a lot of the film is to like promote and uplift them. But also it's just like, I think it's spoken and like, you know, done in so much like awe and reverence for these incredible people. Um, and so I think that's just for me the most been the hardest is like, oh my God, I hope that you guys are like 
you know, <laughs> with it afterwards. Um, and yeah, I mean, the language was like definitely interesting. There'd be times where we'd be on set and you'd hear the story translated from Zapotec into Spanish into English and then back from English into Spanish into Zapotec. And then like, by the, so like literally it wasn't until we were editing with some stories where I was like, oh, that's not at all what I thought that guy said because the translation had gotten different and the time oh. period. Yeah, so like that was definitely, the language of course is interesting, but I think, you know, yeah, just making those people proud. And yeah, they were great people, <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, the first thing that comes to me is like such a producer answer, but I just have to say like, God, fundraising was really hard. Like this was, you know, this film we spent seven years on and a lot of that was was fundraising. Um, and, um, but, you know, I think I'm really grateful for the time that we spent on the front end, like talking to these communities. You know, there's a lot of folks that, that we talked to that, that aren't in the film, whether it wasn't the right time to film there or for whatever reason. Um, but we really just in that that early phase, we really got a sense of of how global the struggle is and these links between the struggles. And um, we just learned there's so many people that are in the film that we learned from, but there's also just so many people that aren't in the film that we learned from too. We're grateful to all of those folks. No, and, and it's very, is, you, you can see it. It's uh, from the stories that we're telling and I'm watching this and I'm just like, oh my God. Like, and sometimes I think it's the things we take it for granted. I think as American, we take for granted, oh yeah, I can plug this in, there's gonna be power. But we never think about where the power comes from unless it affects you in a way, unless you live in maybe a low, so low socioeconomic area you know that there's probably a plant nearby that is providing, you know, clean water for the suburbs out there, but not for the inner city and specific areas. Um, and I, I think it's one of those things that you just don't think about it until it affects you. But watching this makes you think so, makes you not just appre not appreciate, but understand how um, indigenous people globally are treated when it comes to their land and how it's ripped away from them and i think that's a reality that a lot of um i think americans are coming to now or like you know america's ripped away from somebody so you know we're starting to use the language that is the fact not a you know an explorer came and discovered which isn't even true and I think um it it helps with the resistance in a way of saying well this is the fact so once you start to lay out the facts then hopefully um it leads to truths in other areas and how well with the ancestral lands um and you know I, I think sometimes we think, oh, because there's reservations and there's ancestral lands that um, nobody cares for them. They're just out there. When the truth is there is um, people who care for them, uh, who watch over them to protect them. And I think those are so important because those are the people who know the land the best, um, who care for the land the best. Uh, and I think we find that out when there are uh, fires and we realize that there's more fires in one area versus another area and because one area has um, more indigenous people, they know how to do a certain uh, either minimalized fires where other areas has less indigenous people and it's run, you know, running rampant with fires. And those are the type of things that do scar the land and can harm the land in a way when you don't know how to take care of it. So I guess this, this leads me into the question, um, after filming this and um, coming with the final product, what was what type of effect did it have on you that it changed your day to day? Um, how you do things, whether you recycle, whether you don't use power as much, whether you decide I'm going to do more um, maybe uh, foraging from the land around me versus going to the store to buy, um, you know, certain things. Uh, has it changed any way uh, how you currently live? I hate to say no, because it was a really great buildup, but I'm only saying that because um, I grow most of my own food, I raise most of my own food, I barter with people. <laughs> So that's, but I, I grew up on the res, like we grew up mm -hmm. 
out here. Um, so, so yeah, so there's been a lot of times where like I'll barter somebody for like half a sheep and I'll drive them around the state for a day to like run their errands. And then I get half a sheep, which I'll put in the freezer and then in the fridge and I'll live off of that. And like, that's, that's how we do things out here. Um, so it didn't change me a whole lot, but I hope that it affects everyone else because I, I think that it's, these changes are small and subtle to the point where like me living in my house, I grew up with a bunch of white friends like all around and they would come over and they would see how easy it is to compost and how easy <laughs> that is to put it straight into your garden or how easy it is to have chickens and feed them off of your scraps and how easy it is to keep a horse and, you know, um, and like how to put your dogs and your cats to use. Yes, they can be cuddle monsters, but they also are, you know, wild animals that have really extremely cool skills and they would love to help you. Um, and so all of that, I think it's just, it's really easy. It's really simple to like get down to that base root of like how to do this. And I see it in every indigenous community. We all got, you know, you look at people on the res are using like maybe five gallons of water a day, like maybe. Mm. Whereas in town, you've got people using like a hundred, like hundred to 200, 300 gallons of water a day. And mm -hmm. it's like very simple little processes and changes that to me are very simple and easy. And I swear, if I can continue them my entire life moving around the country, then they are simple because <laughs> I didn't need any special things to keep them going. Uh, but yeah, conserving water, that's important everywhere, you know? Um, fire management is super easy fire is necessary for a lot of places like here in northern arizona we have a bunch of fires part of our problem right now is we're not letting fires do its actual job so it's getting to this point where there's so much underbrush that it's causing these really large much hotter fires that are burning the trees instead mm -hmm. of clearing the underbrush mm -hmm. and there are, there are little things like we will let fires go on the res a little bit just a little bit you don't want them to get too big but you're like oh here we're going to clear out some of the underbrush let it go it's going to get rid of these things make it less dangerous for in the future uh it's really simple just ask ask people around you ask the people before you ask your grandmother what did you know that's always my advice is like and if you don't have access to a grandma find one like there is a nully out there who wants to talk to you and so <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's it's really simple so i didn't change a whole lot but that's only because I you were living the life <laughs> you weren't new to it you were true to it i i, I completely love that well, it's really easy, I promise. <laughs> uh, Jordan, for you, is there anything in your everyday life that um, changed after um, the finishing of this film? Um, I mean, first of all, I feel like I learn things from, from Ivy Camille every day when, when we talk. And, and I think also, you know, I, I didn't know like that, you know, you could go to Navajo Nation, like, you know, within the boundaries of the U.S. and that there's people with no electricity, no running water, that don't even speak English on a day to day, they're speaking Diné or, um, and so, you know, I feel like I just learned so much, but, you know, I think part of what this film really hit home to me too, especially like when we filmed in Mexico, is that if you, you know, even when you do environmentally positive things, like if the corporations are still in control of that power, it doesn't get through people, you know, I, I think so much of, of that moment when Bettina is like this town that is like surrounded by windmills, like doesn't get like a single kilowatt of electricity for this, right? So it's, you know, so much of it that I, I think this film really hit home to me that it is not about individual practices, but it's about these systems and about corporate power and the need to challenge that. Oh, but very much. I, when when she said that and she was like we don't get i was like what do you mean you don't get like in my mind i was like i would just go cut all the power lines when i want the power for my community but um i and, and branching to that i loved how you showed i think a lot of times you know we see the clean energy versus dirty energy and we'll just say well why not just put windmills up why not just do this but it's not that that doesn't help it's that where are we putting them up um who's getting the power and are the people who um the land that you took from them are they being proper and not just compensated a little bit but properly compensated um for not just short-term but long-term use um are they also reaping the benefits of this and it also showed um how that is an issue even with clean energy in and, and how uh people aren't getting uh 
you know, the portion that they deserve. So, and I, and I say, I say I appreciated that so much because I think in America we're like, we have to stop doing this, this, and this, but we never think, well, okay, if we put these, these windmills up, where are we going to put them? And how do we compensate the people who own that land? And I loved that port. I just loved it because it was very, um, it was very honest in a sense of, if we do this, we do need land, but we have to do it the proper way and the right way by the people of the land. So I, I appreciate for show, I appreciate you all for um, showing that. And um, uh, oh, I did have a uh, question um, when it came to uh, diversity, because there's so much um, in front of the camera. Um, diversity behind the screen, behind the um, the camera. What did that look like for you all? Um, and how important was it for you all? Um, I know, I don't think we necessarily hired specifically on diversity. I think it was just like, oh, you're the best. Like Tim, um, Tim Sire, our editor, just was a good friend of mine who I met through Firelight Media and was just really awesome and was willing to work on it. Um, we did have like a slight a decision between two um, composers and both were equally talented, but Daniel is somehow related to every single place in the film. Like, um, and so we went, I think, I think that was probably one of the only decisions that we made that was like, we're going to do this based off of who you are. Um, mm -hmm. But we wound up having a lot of diversity in and around. I mean, like, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> we also, uh, we had, yes, yeah, some brilliant diversity behind the camera working um, on the camera, like translation. I think it just kind of, when you work in a global project, when you work in community based, it's gonna happen. You're not mm -hmm. able to not be diverse because community is diverse. And I think that's, I think that's how we made our film. Yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll just say like, I think that part of what Ivy Camille is really bringing up is that actually if you are like hiring the best people for the job, they usually will be people of color, like and from, you know, and I think like, it was great, like, yeah, Melissa Cardona, who's Colombian, you know, was really great to film with as our cinematographer for, you know, the whole film, but especially was great for being with, with her in Colombia. Yeah, and and Daniel French as Latino and Mohawk, like, um, I think just had these real connections to these communities that that you can really hear in the music that, that he composed and, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm so grateful for everybody involved in, in this project. It was a really brilliant team. Uh, it was amazing. The music was amazing as well. The the um, song that closed the movie, I was just like, oh my gosh. I was like, can I find this on Spotify? Like, I love this. Um, we'll release the soundtrack. We think like in the fall, it's gonna come out. Ooh, okay, I'll be looking out for it. Um, I, and so um, I asked you about your challenges with the film, but what is something that you you loved? Um, like maybe a favorite moment in the film. Um, do you have any or multiple favorite moments? Oh my God, I have so many. There's um, when they're putting the trash away next to the thing and the, the bottles are going clink. That's not in the music. It's just clink, it's, oh, it makes my brain happy. <laughs> Something about it. Uh, let's see. I mean, there's beautiful footage. I mean, I definitely help behind some of the cameras. So sometimes I'm like, oh man, I'm so good. <laughs> Melissa is just like phenomenal. Her work is just so like it speaks in its own like way. It's I don't know. I think this is one of the first films that I have finished making, and I've been like cool with watching it over and over again afterwards. So like. That's two thumbs up for me. <laughs> I think for both of us, like, because we've seen this film so many times, like, we're going to have all these moments, like, that clinking of the bottles, like, that we're so familiar with, but nobody else watching, like, has any idea. Like, yeah, I have so many moments like that that are, like, that are, like, tidy in my head. But, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, in general, in, in that whole scene, like, them spray painting that, and painting that that water tower was just like a really beautiful moment to be a part of. Um, you know, getting woken up at like 3 a.m. by some people that were like, hey, we're gonna take you to these like um, communist gorillas in the hills. And we're like, where are we going? That was that was pretty amazing. Like, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like we just in general got to see people trusted us with these. But I mean, everywhere that that we filmed, whether in Navajo Nation or in Columbia, like it is those places are really hard to get to. There's like you, they, in most cases, like you cannot take a road to to a lot of the places that we filmed at. Um, and and we're just it's like getting to to just be in people's kitchens and in in people's lives and and, and communities you know just i mean stuff that's not in the film like i remember ivy camille like when we were in i think it was bettina's house and like we were like bonding with her whole family like yeah some great coffee <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask that i was like how was the coffee i heard the coffee is amazing <laughs> That was in Oaxaca. Really good coffee. <clears throat> um, and her daughters are so cool. Uh, one of her daughters, so the area that we were in, Ixtepec, Ixtepec, and Yucatan, it's a huge um, travel site migration point for a lot of Miche, which is the word for trans folk. And so they were it, it a safe harbor. So people were coming from all over South America and Mexico to come to these Christ City area for safety. And so you, there were these beautiful murals on the wall of all these like Miche women and Miche men and just like it was absolutely stunning. And um, so I was talking to her daughter about it and her daughter was writing a dissertation on the history of the migration of the Miche to this area and why it was happening. And so she was teaching me all about it. It was really cool. We didn't speak the oh, same wow. language. So we were like really trying to figure it out, but it was really cool. Oh my gosh, that that's amazing. I'm sorry, I want to read that. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to do in filming. Sometimes I sit down and talk to that person who's like, I don't want to get on camera. And then you're like, whoa, that's so cool. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh, no, it's, I loved, um, I would say the, the artistry. Because in that, like, what you're saying, like the murals, you can tell, like, from the people, just very vibrant um, from the, the singers, um, the singers and the poets performing. And I just love, I love resistance in using the art as an art form um, and doing it through your art form. And you saw that like within the film, of course, but also within the people and um, showing the different ways that they resist against um, the government and the systems. And it, it really resonated just with a sense of um, if you're ever somebody like trying to get back to your roots or understand like your past more, a lot of times it's um, through the land. And I think for um, black indigenous and people of color globally, um, the land is where we always start. And um, if you don't have access to land, if you don't have the land, it's hard to start that journey um, to, to do those things. And it was, it wasn't something necessarily said verbatim, but it that's what the film said to me. Um, and I really love that message because personally, me and my sister, we were plant ladies. So we buy a lot of plants. Um, my father's side's Caribbean. So I've learned like, oh, like these plants do this thing, do that thing. So like learning, because those things are important. You, you, you want to know the different... Um, ways to use like not just aloe vera but you know certain plants that you may see out um in your yard um and so me and my sister are like oh really well which one of us is going to try it first and let that one know it works so you know this like exploring that and i love to hear that it is a common practice within communities because there's a level of that it's safe um that it works um and that the land is important and that it should be kept um, safe and, you know, kept up in a proper way um, and not poisoned by uh, the things that we're, we're working for to get under it. Um, and so uh, I will ask one last question. Um, and the last question is, what is next for you both? Um, are you working on something else, a continuation from uh, the same um, idea as Powerlands or something totally different? Uh, so I'm working on two feature documentaries right now. Uh, one, we are in the production stage. It is um, in 1989, a woman got lost in South Dakota in Wind Cave, which is the uh, third largest and the most complicated caving system in the United States and in the world. Um, 
it is absolutely stunning, gorgeous, the birthplace of the Lakota Sioux Nations, but she was lost for 38 hours um, before being rescued and then later gave birth to me. Um, oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I was not expecting that. We're to look at like motherhood and what that means to, you know, find motherhood in the earth and mm-hmm. then come out and find motherhood afterwards. Um, and so is there, there's that one. And then I'm also working on an MMIW film that is ripping my soul in half, um, but really good uh, where I'm looking at um, the post-militarization of police after 9-11 and mm-hmm. how that affected specifically indigenous women with um, getting cases solved mm-hmm. uh, by looking at cases that were done beforehand and then done afterwards and saying um, when the difference, because a lot of cops, especially now, because tribal cops are not allowed to arrest non-tribal members. So if you are a non-tribal member on the res, you could do whatever the f- you want. Like, yep, that's that's legal. That's a thing. It's in the books, all the reses. Um, it's a huge problem on all the reses. The second thing is that uh, non-tribal cops are, are not allowed on the reses. So they oftentimes will just say like, oh, it's jurisdiction. And so if a native woman gets murdered, say here in town, a lot of the time they're like, well, I don't know if it's my jurisdiction. I think it's the FBI's. But I mean, there's only so many FBI people because that's who's allowed to cover our cases. Even like tribal cops are not allowed to do murder cases. Only the FBI is for us. It's it's ridiculous. It's fun. There's a reason why we have so many missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, and but especially with the post-militarization, we saw the rise of jurisdiction coming mm-hmm. up a lot more. And um, yeah, now we're not getting cases solved like at all. Mm, no, oh, I can't wait to, that is very interesting. I do want to hear that because I've never heard of the complexities of police force on reservations. And I think a lot of people haven't, if we're being completely honest, but that is very uh, civil, civil, it, civil rights my grandfather was a cop and he couldn't uh arrest white people and got in trouble when he did because <laughs> he resisted so he did <laughs> so um but hearing that I was just like whoa like i never knew that so oh, i'll definitely be looking out for that <laughs> <laughs> it's been pre-production it's a while down the way but yeah it's it's crazy how many of these cases just like literally like we'll solve them for the police officers and then like the tribal cops are like i can't do anything and then the non-tribal cops are like jurisdiction and then the fbi is like there's only a hundred of us and so it's literally yeah you'll have cases where you're like we that's the murderer him right there that guy walking up that's the murderer and can't do anything about it oh gosh oh my god um, well, I am looking forward to both of those. Uh, they are amazing, and your mother's amazing. Yes. That's absolutely wild. I love hearing that. Um, and Jordan, what's next for you? Um, so many projects, but I guess one that I'm really excited about is I am uh, working on a hybrid science fiction documentary about a world without police or prisons. Sorry about that noise going by in the background. A World Without Police or Prisons. I'm working with Afrofuturist writer Walida Imarisha, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and yeah, hopefully Ivy Camille and I are working together on more stuff. We're kind of, uh, we can't let go of each other. No, I'm gonna move into Jordan's house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds fun. If y'all have a party, please send me an invite. I will come. I cook. I, um, so there You're always are- welcome, Justine. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing your amazing work on Powerlands. Um, and uh, for all that are watching and um, that are listening or watching uh, this Q&A, um, I hope that you learned something and that um, you walk away with knowing something to not just uh, do right by yourself, but also by the land. And so uh, until next time, thank you again, Jordan and uh, Ivy Camille for coming and share and hope to see you soon. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you.